Hello, everybody, and welcome to That Wrestling Show, the podcast where all pro wrestling matters. I am your host, Billy Ann Covey, and what a week here on the program. Going to be talking about the WWE draft that took place this past Friday and Monday. Excuse me. i uh, got to get my thoughts on the draft as a whole, who won, who lost, and what are they going to do with some of these people. Plus, uh going to look at the G1 Climax. It is in its final weekend, and Block A, by the time you guys are listening to this, has already been determined. So, going to catch you up on that. Plus, I'm going to talk about a new wrestling series that just started this week that I actually recommend if you are capable of, you know, watching it to go check it out i think you guys will like it um let's start with the news that came out yesterday which was a little surprising and that is john cena got married yes you did not hear that wrong john cena finally he took the plunge ladies and gentlemen he took the plunge, and he is no longer a single man. He is married. Uh, this happened yesterday. Um, I don't have, unfortunately, the original uh, article that was written. PW Insider was actually the one that broke the story. But I am going to read the TMZ report that came out with this. John Cena is a married man, tying the knot with his girlfriend Shay Shariatsade. I'm sure I botched that name wrong, but, you know, in Tampa, Florida. The couple began dating back in early 2019 following Cena's high-profile split with ex-fiance Nikki Bella in 2018. Cena and Shay, because I honestly refuse to try to pronounce that last name again, got very serious very quickly and were spotted making out all over town for the past year. Apparently, the two got engaged on the down low and filed for a marriage certificate in Florida earlier this month. According to official documents obtained by TMZ Sports, they swapped I do's on October the 12th in a ceremony in Tampa. News of the marriage was first reported by PW Insider. By the way, Shay was born in Iran but is a Canadian citizen. She works as a product manager for a tech company in Vancouver. Uh, TMZ reached out to Cena's camp for comment, but you know he's probably off doing newlywed things. This is Cena's second wedding. He was previously married to Elizabeth Hubbardu from 2009 to 2012. And of course, we all know the long story of John Cena and Nikki Bella. Dated for six years, proposed at WrestleMania 33, uh, broke up right before the wedding, and both have gone in their separate ways. And it looks like they are both happy as... Cena got married this week, and as we know, Nikki Bella has a kid, has a son, with Artem Shigvintsev from Dancing with the Stars. Um, first off, congratulations. Congratulations to John Cena getting married. I honestly, I honestly did not think this was going, I, I didn't think he'd ever get married again. With the first marriage lasting three years, and then that long period of time with Nikki Bella, and I I have felt, I don't, I don't think I've ever said it on this show, but I think now's a good time for me to say it. I always thought that relationship at times was staged. I never thought that was a real relationship. It was maybe a way for Nikki to get some press by being with John Cena and vice versa. Um, 
I mean, I'm glad. I mean, I'm I'm glad that John Cena got married. I'm glad he's happy. Um, this sort of reminds me, in a way, of George Clooney. And I know that name has not been brought up in years because he's. I, I think he's actually been living a quiet life uh, since he got married. But if you remember, George Clooney dated so many women. And then for the longest time, he was dating Stacy Keebler. And then they broke up. And then he ends up marrying a doctor. I, I, I might be wrong on that. And you haven't really heard much from George Clooney since. And I'm not comparing John Cena to George Clooney. Don't I, I'm I'm sure if the female demographic is listening to this, I am in no way comparing John Cena to George Clooney. But it just has this George Clooney vibe of now he is married. Is this going to last? I, I like to think that it will. I, I really do. Cena seems like the kind of guy who he has his goals, he has his ideals, he has everything that he would like to have, and he gets married on a very good date, actually, October the 12th, that's a, that's a really good date, um, I just, you know what, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a person, I'm gonna be, you know, a caring person, I'm gonna wish the both of them good luck on their marriage, I, I hope it works out, um, Maybe this marriage will last a long time, and I and I really hope it does because this one wasn't really publicized that much, like the Cena Nikki Bella thing. Because God, that was all over, you know, like television with Total Divas and in Total Bellas and the the proposal at WrestleMania 33 and just all that stuff. And I'm like, all right, you know. Good for him. Good good for John. Good for John. Deserves to be happy. Deserves to have a good life. So congratulations to John Cena and his new wife, Shay, on their marriage. So hopefully uh, things will work out for everybody in the end. Okay, let's get into the G1 Climax. Uh, today was the Block A Finals. There were four people that had a chance to win the block. Kota Ibushi, Jay White, uh, Kazuchika Okada, and Will Ospreay each had a chance to win the block. So, Ibushi won his match. Ospreay defeated Okada and in so turned his back on Okada leaving Chaos, which comes as a big surprise. And Jay White loses with a chance to win the block, loses to Tomohiro Ishii. Therefore, Kota Ibushi wins the A block, and for the second year in a row, Kota Ibushi will go to the finals which is this Sunday. Now, who is he going to face? Well, we're going to figure that out. We're going to know by tomorrow because there are four people in contention to win the block. In block B right now, it is a two-way tie for first. Evil and Tetsuya Naido each have 12 points. Evil has the tiebreaker based on he defeated Naido during the tournament. That's between those two. Sonata and Zack Sabre Jr. are each tied at 10 points. So, this is how it breaks down. We'll start with the easiest one being Evil. All Evil has to do tomorrow is win. That's all he has to do. He has to win tomorrow. Beats Sonata, and he wins the block. That's the easy way. The more complicated way 
is he can end in a draw or a no contest with Sonata. Tetsuya Naido loses and Zack Sabre either ends up with a loss or a draw. Tetsuya Naido, his is pretty easy. He wins the block with a win or a draw over Kenta and an evil loss or no contest. Sonata's is pretty easy as well. He must beat Evil, and then Naido must either lose or go to an O contest. Zack Sabre Jr. is a little bit complicated. He must end the block being tied with Naido and Evil, and then with a win over Hiroshi Tanahashi, who surprisingly is out of the tournament. I, I was very surprised. Naido loses, and both Sonata or the Sonata Evil match must go to a no contest. All of that happens. Zack Saber Jr. wins the B block. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see who comes out tomorrow with the win. Uh, normally, the champion does not win the block, so I wouldn't be surprised if. Naido does not win it. I, I don't know. I, I, I would be surprised. I would be very interested if Sonata wins the block because you'd have a Sonata Abushi final, and then, oh boy, get get ready. Uh, get ready for quite a fascinating final on Sunday, and then of course, whoever wins the G one is technically getting the title shot at Wrestle Kingdom come January the 4th in Tokyo. Alright, some interesting news with Ring of Honor, and, and this is a this is a combination news here because this goes to over the weekend, the previous weekend, uh the collective event that took place in Indianapolis last weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think there were about 10 shows in total that took place over three days. So, the shows pulled, being pulled off were a success. However, since these shows happened, three wrestlers have come out and said that they had tested positive for COVID-19. The three are AC Mack, Dan the Dad, and Cabana Man Dan. This, the, the whole event was a good collection of talent of not only the independent scene, but wrestlers that are in Ring of Honor, that are in AEW, that are in Impact. So because of this, and because we have three people that did test positive, Ring of Honor made a decision today that some of the talent that they brought in for TV tapings would not be used due to being in contact with people who tested positive from last weekend. And... I have to applaud Ring of Honor. Um, They are really making the case that they might be the best wrestling promotion to have handled the the entire global pandemic. When they came back to do the first set of TV tapings, which was for the Pure Wrestling Title Tournament, which is still going on, and I recommend everyone check it out. I really do. They had the wrestlers be quarantined for two weeks before they started the tapings. So, they did this again, or they're doing another set of TV tapings this week, and now you have some wrestlers that we we don't know if they ended up being positive or not. We just know that these guys and girls were within the vicinity of a few people who tested positive for COVID, and 
you don't want to get anybody sick. And I totally understand that. So when the next set of TV tapings happen, if you watch Ring of Honor Wrestling, we could figure out who the people are that were not allowed to wrestle. So it'll be interesting to see who it is. But I think it's a good call by Ring of Honor. They had to do this. You don't want to get anybody sick. You do not, under any circumstance, want to get anybody sick. I missed, actually, last week on doing The Masked Singer. It was such a busy week last week because there was a review and I was making predictions that I did not talk about The Masked Singer this pat or last week. So I'm going to get you guys caught up on the October 7th episode and this week's episode. So, uh, week three, the popcorn sang Falling by Harry Styles. The giraffe sang Get Down On It by Cool and the Gang. The snow owls sang Like I'm Gonna Lose You by Megan Trainer featuring John Legend. And the sun sang Praying by Kesha. The giraffe was voted out. And in a surprise, it was Brian Austin Green who was the giraffe. Very, very good job by Mr. Green. Uh, This week, The Serpent sang The Bones by Marin Morris. Crocodile with a very interesting choice. Uh, Singing Toxic by Britney Spears. The Baby Alien sang It's Time by Imagine Dragons. The Whatchamacallit sang Moneymaker by Ludacris featuring Pharrell. And the Seahorse sang My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion. Uh, The Baby Alien ended up being eliminated. I think that was the right call on that. Um, Not saying that the Baby Alien was the weakest, but I just thought, you know, of the five, the Baby Alien had to go. And... This was a big surprise. Nobody got this right. It ended up being former NFL quarterback Mark Sanchez. That's right. The master of the butt fumble himself, Mark Sanchez, was the baby alien. And, gotta say, didn't do too bad of a job. Not gonna lie. Okay, so to give you guys a quick update... Uh, next week there is no episode of The Masked Singer because it'll be Game 2 of the World Series. It may come back October 28th. Not really sure. It obviously will depend on the World Series. If it goes to a 7th game, then it'll get pushed back a week. If it does not go to a 7th game, then the next episode of The Masked Singer will be on October 28th where we will finally meet... Group C, and to give you all a quick reminder of who Group C is, it is Broccoli, Jellyfish, Lips, Mushroom, and Squiggly Monster. Those are the five for Group C. So far, this has been a fun uh, season of The Masked Singer. Uh, obviously, we got a long way to go to the end, but, you know, I kind of like, I, I, I think what's really cool with this particular season of The Mask Singer is when they're giving out the clues, and they're animated, and I actually like that, and they're doing it as a, you know, safety precaution because of the COVID, um... I think it, you know, it's actually a pretty smart move. I like it. So maybe they keep the animated clues in future seasons. But that's just one person's hopeful thinking. Now, let's talk about the WWE draft. It happened last week. Two shows long. Got to go down round by round. Um... Tell you what was good, what was not good. Was this pick right? So, uh, let's start off with Friday night. Night one. 
of the draft. And the first round, uh, you know, for the, the most part, I'd say the first round was pretty predictable, except for one spot, which I'll mention in a minute. So, Raw, in round one, drafted Drew McIntyre, Asuka, and the Hurt Business. SmackDown drafted Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins. And I have to applaud WWE for doing that move, making that move, switching Seth Rollins to SmackDown. Uh, I think that whole Monday Night Messiah gimmick was getting very old. And he needed to get out of there. And this was the best time to do it. Also, have to applaud Hurt Business. Within a matter of four months, this group, and they've actually become one of my favorite groups in wrestling today, end up being a first round pick. How great is that? Bobby Lashley, Sheldon Benjamin, Cedric Alexander, MVP, the Herb Business. Like I said, they're one of my favorite groups in wrestling today. Probably one of my favorite acts going in wrestling today, getting drafted in the first round. Very, very good. Round two. uh, This was pretty much the women's round. Uh, Raw got AJ Styles, Naomi, and the Women's Tag Team Champions, Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. SmackDown got Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair. Uh, I think AJ going to Raw is a smart move. Uh, You need to have... Like like I said last week, if, if Randy Orton does not win the title at Hell in a Cell, which I'll talk about next week, and they need a new heel, a new challenging heel for the WWE title. AJ Styles is your guy, right there. So I like that move. Um, Bianca Belair to SmackDown, that's going to be a very, very interesting situation there, uh, considering you have Sasha Banks, and then, well, we'll wait for Bailey when her name comes up. Round three... Raw selected Ricochet, Mandy Rose. I don't even know why they had to go through that process with Mandy Rose. She was just traded two weeks ago to the show in The Miz and John Morrison. SmackDown got Jey Uso and Dominic and Rey Mysterio. Oh boy. That just means that feud is never going to end. Um... Here, I'd like to think that Ricochet is going to get a chance, but I highly doubt it'll happen. I really do. I, I'd love to see him get a chance, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Miz and John Morrison go into Raw, that's kind of meh. Dominic and Rey Mysterio going to SmackDown is like, well, at least I don't have to continue watching that storyline on a weekly basis there. And then we get to round four. Round four might be the most interesting round, not only of night one, but maybe the entire draft. Raw takes Kofi Kingston and, and Xavier Woods, Dana Brooke, and Angel Garza. Again, I don't know why they had to do Dana Brooke. She was just traded there two weeks ago. SmackDown gets Big E and Otis. And the New Day has been split apart. The New Day has been split. After almost six years being together, one of, arguably, one of the best three-man stables in history has been split up. It's a shame that this is the way it has to go, but Big E is that special talent that I think now's the time to push him to the top. I really do. Now's the time. 
And with Otis, well, we're going to find out right now. Because we had a fifth round that happened on Talking Smack. So this was aired the next morning. Raw, in round five, took Humberto Carrillo, Tucker, and Drew Gulak. So Heavy Machinery is no more. How heartbreaking is that? SmackDown gets Murphy and Kalisto. So the whole Rollins Mysterio angle gets moved to SmackDown. Where I do not have to feel uncomfortable with what is going on with Aaliyah. Um, so here, four and five, you split up heavy machinery, which I really don't know why you do. I, I just don't know why you do that. And you have New Day be split up. I mean, Kofi and, and Xavier are still together, but Biggie is on his own now. Uh, like I said, I really hope something good comes for Big E. I really do. But why split them up? Why? I mean, or at least why that way? How about that? Why split them that way? Uh, then we're going to talk about night two and how that all happened. Because we had a WWE Network exclusive. Raw picked up Grand Metalik and Lince Dorado. So Lucha House Party is now done. Or at least they've been split up. SmackDown gets Shorty G. Okay. Now we go to night two. Round one. Raw gets Bray Wyatt. Randy Orton and Charlotte Flair. SmackDown gets Bailey and the Street Profits. And then this is where, after you know, reading stuff, because I was actually at my nephew's birthday uh, dessert gift event thingy. So I didn't watch the first hour of Raw. Maybe it's a good thing I didn't. So, the SmackDown Tag Team Champions get drafted to Raw. The Raw Tag Team Champions get drafted to SmackDown. The best thing they could have done is unify the titles. Why not? You already have that with the Women's Tag Team Champions where they can go to any show to defend, you know... The women's tag team titles. Why not unify both titles? Nope. Because ladies and gentlemen. One of the stupidest things. I've ever heard. In my 30 years of being a wrestling fan. Actually happened. And I never thought. This would happen in a million. I don't think anyone ever thought of this. The previous Raw Tag Champions gave their belts to the new Raw Tag Team Champions. And the previous SmackDown Tag Team Champions gave those belts to the new SmackDown Tag Team Champions. (sighs) What? was that what was that you mean to tell me the WWE could not have been creative enough to say well we've switched the team or we switch you know the teams with the championships let's not why don't we just unify both belts have one tag team champion which would have made a lot of sense But then again, this is WWE. 
So, in hindsight, Street Profits, who were the Raw Tag Team Champions, never got beat for the belts. They vacate the belts to the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, who got drafted to Raw and vacated the SmackDown Tag Team titles to the team that was the Raw Tag Team Champions. That's just a bad booking decision. It's just a dumb booking decision. Round two. Raw got Braun Strowman, Matt Riddle, and Jeff Hardy. Hey, I said Matt Riddle should go to Raw. Hey, look at me. SmackDown got Daniel Bryan and Kevin Owens. Okay. I actually I actually have nothing to say about this. That's actually a good round right there. Round three. Round three. Raw gets retribution because, you know, they're under contract. Keith Lee and Alexa Bliss. The Bliss move makes sense with what's going on with the Fiend. SmackDown may have wasted their two picks on this one. Because they draft Lars Sullivan and King Corbin. King Corbin hasn't really meant anything since WrestleMania. (laughs) And it's being very generous. Lars Sullivan, on the other hand, somehow still has a job in WWE. Because there were allegations that came out this week that Lars was sending inappropriate texts to a female that is married. How does this guy still have a job? He he is in the same department as Velveteen Dream and Austin Theory in the creep zone. How do they still have a job? I'm going to have to hire a detective for that one. Round four. Raw gets Elias, Lacey Evans, and Sheamus. Oh, okay. Nothing really there. SmackDown got Sami Zayn, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Cesaro. Uh, Okay, nothing really there. Round five. Raw gets Nikki Cross, R-Truth, and Dabakato from Raw Underground. SmackDown gets Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode, and Apollo Crews. Uh, okay. Nothing really there to discuss. Round six. Raw gets Titus O'Neil, Peyton Royce, which I actually like because I said Billy Kay should go to SmackDown. And guess what? Billy Kay does end up going to SmackDown. And Akira Tozawa. And if you didn't watch Raw, what they did with each draft pick is they put in some notes about the different people that got drafted. Akira Tozawa's last note, and I laughed at this because it was it was one of those funny, stupid ones. Akira Tozawa is a leader, or is leader of a ninja gang, or ninja clan. Wow. And and that's what it says. That's what it said, folks. If you don't believe me, type it in, Google, go to Akira Tozawa Raw Draft, and you'll see leader of a ninja clan. SmackDown ended up drafting Cher and Aleister Black. 
Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's Carmella. Carmella and Aleister Black. Look, Carmella looks like Cher. Just, just go look at a picture of her from two weeks ago. And then uh, we had one more round on Raw Talk after Raw ended. Raw drafted Lana, who won the main event of Raw and gets drafted on the after show. Okay. Uh, they also got Riddick Moss and Arturo Ruas, who had been on Raw Underground. SmackDown got Natalia and the Riot Squad. And that's it. That's how it ends. Huh. So that is the WWE draft of 2020. You had you had some rounds that were actually good rounds. And then you had some rounds that were just ter- they were just crap. Let's just call it like it is. It's crap. Um Eric from the Viking Raiders ended up going to Raw even though he was not drafted. They signed him because he was a free agent. Yeah, that's a that's a thing. Uh like I said, uh Billy Kay ended up going to SmackDown. She got signed there. And also Zelina Vega did and Tamina uh got signed to SmackDown as well. Now, this leaves a very interesting person out of this mix. Andrade. What does or what happens to Andrade? Does he do they do a storyline of he wants to go to Raw, he wants to go to SmackDown, he you know can't get signed. Does he go back to NXT? Because they're clearly not using him at all the right way. Um, there's a lot of things that could happen with Andrade. Part of me worries a little bit that, you know, he's not going to get used at all. I, I think he's too far above being used in the Heath Slater angle of, you know, I got kids, I need to get a job. Something will happen but I'm just not sure what it is right now. Just not sure. Uh, the winners of the draft, and there really aren't that many, uh, right off the bat, Seth Rollins is was a winner of this draft. He had to get moved from Raw to SmackDown. Absolutely had to. Otherwise, it was going to continue to be stale. And they made the move. Thank God for that. Uh, Another winner. I I gotta go with the Hurt Business. You get drafted in the first round on the first night. That's a big win. That is a big win there. I'd have them as a winner. I'd... Also would have AJ Styles as a winner. He gets to go to Raw. Um let me let me look at his list one more time. Um I there aren't see there aren't too many winners in this draft. There really aren't. Matt Riddle, I think going to Raw is gonna be a good move. Uh That's really about it. There are a lot of losers in this draft. The fans are the biggest losers. Because we had to sit through that. New Day was a big loser in this draft. Just why? Why split them up? Uh, Heavy Machinery 
That's another loser in the draft. Why split them up? I mean, at this point, you're not doing much with Otis. He's got the contract. You know, what What the hell are you going to do there? Um, Sami Zayn, I'd call a loser in this draft. He doesn't get drafted until the fourth round on night two? And I, and I know, you know, like, the, the, the brands had, you know, the wrestlers had different days. But still, round four? Oof. Not that good. And I'm going to say Lana was a loser. Because she won a battle royal on the main event of Raw. And she gets drafted after the show. <laughs> ah, doesn't make sense. This whole draft did not go over well. Or at least on paper, it did not go over well. How it ends up in the future remains to be seen. So, we'll see how it all goes. Oh, and and let's talk about what they got planned on SmackDown tonight. Because, you know, we had the draft and, oh, Braun Strowman's competing for the Universal title. Huh? The guy just got drafted. Lars Sullivan is going to face Jeff Hardy tonight. Huh? I thought we were done with the interpromotional stuff. I thought we were. I guess we're not. guess we're not. Okay, one more story I want to bring up, and then I'm going to wrap it up for this week. Um, WWE had talked about... Uh, Getting back, doing live shows, house shows in 2021. Well, those plans may have changed. Because it looks like now that it is not going to start until 2022. And what their schedule is. TV show Friday night. House shows Saturday and Sunday. Of course, of course, you have the pay-per-view on Sunday. Raw on Monday. That's it. They were going to attempt to get this going at the beginning of next year. But with the raise in cases as of late, it looks like more than likely that they're not going to go through with this. That they will wait until 2022. And I think that's the right call. I really do. I mean, if you look at AEW, they're holding their show in one place, which is Dailies. Ring of Honor films their stuff. Major League Wrestling is about to start filming their stuff soon. Impact films their stuff at one place. Uh, NWA, they're slowly starting to come back around. The Japanese promotions are doing shows in different cities, but the people are getting uh, bubbled in, which is a smart move. And... CMLL, they're only doing one show. AAA, I think, is going to do a drive-in, drive-in movie theater type show. So, honestly, I don't think they should do this kind of schedule right now. And if it means that they can't do European tours for a, a year, or if they can't go to Saudi Arabia, which they shouldn't even be doing in the first place, then I think it's going to be good for the wrestlers. I really do. So... We will see uh, what happens in the very, very near future. Well, on that note, that is going to wrap it up for this week. But let's get into the plugs. If you guys have any questions or comments, send an email. Wrestlingman at thatwrestlingshow.com If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me and I'll read them on the show. Follow the show on Twitter at WrestlingShow11. 
Follow us on Instagram at That Wrestling Show. Join our Facebook group, That Wrestling Show fan group. We are, as of this recording, 11 people away from 500. We can hit 500 people by the end of this year. Uh, check out our merch store, teespring.com, backslash That Wrestling Show podcast, and visit the Patreon page, patreon.com, backslash That Wrestling Show. Even though Fro isn't here, I will plug another Digital Citizen where this week they review the movie Henchman, plus uh, they talk about the news and TV of the week, uh, Tron tells the truth, and much, much more this week on Another Digital Citizen. Uh, if you're looking for other podcasts, and I mean, you know, there's so many good ones. Check out our Vantage Point, the Retro Wrestling Podcast, with Joe Morata and Michael Quinn. They take you through the world of retro wrestling. This week, they discuss WrestleMania drop-offs, plus week three of the Royal Flush of the Worst Factions Ever, and a review of Wrestling Challenge from November 9th, 1986. Plus, up today, up today, a live review as Joe and Mike watch the last Saturday night's main event that aired on a- or NBC for 15 years. The April 27th, 1991 episode of Saturday night's main event. Check it out on our Vantage Point. Now, if you like your podcasts hosted by one individual, check out Greetings from Allentown with P.W. Peter Winson. He watches one episode of wrestling each week in his own unique way. This week, he watches an episode of Wrestling Challenge. Oh my god, we're getting Wrestling Challenge mentioned twice this week. Uh, This one is from November 13th, 1988, which features Bret Hart against Greg Valentine. That should be an interesting match to check out. That is greetings from Allentown. Check out the Juice Pro Wrestling Podcast, where this week they are joined... By Gene Snitsky. Hey, it wasn't his fault that he's on this episode. They discussed their new movie, along with Ernie O'Donnell and Stacey Toy. They discuss A Hundred Acres of Hell. That actually sounds like a good movie, the title of it. Check out Juice Pro Wrestling. And check out Two Fans Review Wrestling Podcast this week. They enter the war games as they're going to review WCW Fall Brawl 1995, plus your retro news and much more this week on Two Fans Review Wrestling Podcast. If you're looking for non-wrestling related podcasts, check out the Best Pick Movie Podcast with Tom, John, and Jess, where they watch each and every Academy Award winning Best Picture winner in no particular order. This week, they take a, a little bit of a left turn on their show because they're going to discuss the films of Stanley Kubrick, and they are joined by special guest Garrett Millerick, as they will be talking about Stanley Kubrick films. So if you are a fan of Stanley Kubrick pictures, this is one podcast you're going to want to check out. Also check out Unspooled with Paul and Amy, as they're going through Classic horror movies, you know, we're into the Halloween season, and their whole thing is eventually all these movies they're watching, they're going to end up getting sent to outer space, or hopefully they'd like to. This week, they discuss the 2014 Australian psychological film, The Babadook. Never seen that movie, so I can't really put my two cents on that one. Check out Last Stop Penn Station with... Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni as we go into the life of Carrie Silken. This week, he talks about collecting, collector of cards, magazines, action figures, and so much more this week on Last Stop Penn Station. Also, check out The Castle Vault, a chronological deep dive of Disney animated films powered by Disney+. Plus. Two men watch every Disney animated movie in order. This week, They discuss from 2005, Chicken Little. I want to say I've seen it, but I've never seen the whole thing, so I can't really put uh, anything on that. 
Plus, check out Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, where this week they discuss, or they sit down with John Gorley and Zach Carruthers, the founding members of Portugal the Man, as they discuss their brand new song, Who's Gonna Stop Me, which features Weird Al Yankovic on the track. So those are all the podcasts that you guys should check out. Okay, next week uh, is actually a busy week because next week I'm going to be make It's pay-per-view weekend. We have a pay-per-view weekend. Two pay-per-views back-to-back. Next Saturday night, Bound for Glory, Impact Wrestling's biggest show of the year, and WWE Hell in a Cell. I will go through all the matches and I will make my prediction as to who will win all the matches on those two events. So on that note, everybody, have a good, safe weekend, no matter where you are, and come back next week for another episode of That Wrestling Show, the podcast where all pro wrestling matters. And as always, wrestle on.